Good morning, I'm Dee Cusack. Welcome to day two of MHLC. I'm really delighted to open this day, which is all about technology and digital transformations, subjects that are near and dear to my heart. I started at Thematic just about the same time that COVID hit. So the idea of virtual interaction being the new normal is really just another day at the office for me. But in many ways, I joined Thematic at a very auspicious time. Out of necessity, the pandemic really helped accelerate the adoption of digital supply chains. Our customers needed it. In fact, many of our customers demanded it. Their very survival depended on our ability to provide them with new business models. So we made the decision to dramatically bolster our software offerings to support our customers. To really look at the movement, storage, and distribution of goods throughout our customers' entire supply chains. As our CEO, Hassan Dendashley said, software is no longer something to be added to a solution. It's a fundamental, inextricable part of all solutions. This makes sense. Whether you're a multinational business or an individual, we all rely on technology to do more for us. I remember the days when a cell phone was just a phone. Today, there's so much more. They've really become an integral part of the way that we run our lives, likewise in our industry. Technology doesn't replace equipment, but it enables the equipment to work smarter and do more for us and our customers. From intelligent control tower technology to predictive analytics, really to allow our customers to, to learn more about their flow of goods using smarter technology that meets our future challenges. Our customers are demanding a new level of analytics and prediction technology, and it's our job to deliver. While innovation is critical for the future of our industry, it doesn't replace people. Success also hinges on our most timeless asset, our human talent. And that really remains at the center of all of our supply chain strategies. And that's really why this conference is so important. It's a platform to provide meaningful conversation person to person. Check out the Startup Pavilion to hear fresh new thinkers from companies that are tackling some of our toughest business challenges. Go to the Sponsor Pavilion to learn about their offerings and how they're supporting our digital transformation. Schedule a brain date. It's a communication tool that takes the awkwardness out of networking and takes everything to a whole new level of, of value. And don't miss our virtual tech tour. This is where you can deep dive into the world of technologies and learn about our products and applications for your specific needs. But right now, stay where you are. The excitement begins with the first of two fascinating keynotes. The first given by world leading experts on smart globalization. Haiyan Wang is an adjunct professor of strategy at INSEED. She is also managing partner of China India Institute, a Washington DC based research consulting organization with a focus on creating winning global strategies. Anil Gupta, chairman of China India Institute is widely regarded as one of the world's leading experts on the strategy, globalization and entrepreneurship. Please join me in welcoming Haiyang Wang and Anil Gupta for their keynote Gearing Up Globalization, The New Global Reality. Good morning. It's great to join MHLC's Global Virtual Conference. The theme of this conference is beyond. In the fog of COVID, it's hard to look beyond the waves of COVID variant. Reality seems to take shape one month at a time. Yet, as leaders, we must cast our vision far and wide. We need to not just respond to green or red signals, but have the sensing capability to detect and interpret weak gray signals from afar ahead of others. As we look into the future, 
How are new global realities unfolding? First, the structure of the global economy will continue to undergo transformation, driven by the rise of emerging markets, foremost emerging Asia. COVID hit emerging markets hard, but the long-term big picture is this. Emerging markets catch-up game goes on. From accounting for just 20% of world GDP 20 years ago, in the coming decade, emerging markets could weigh as much as the developed economies. Why are we optimistic about this picture? Because the fundamental forces that have lifted the third world from backwaters are overall still going in the right direction. From state to market, from bureaucrats to entrepreneurs, from isolation to global integration, from illiteracy to literacy, from ignorant to more informed and connected, from rural to urban, from agriculture to industry and services. Wait a second, you may say, aren't we see protectionism, nationalism, and government control on the rise? Yes, they do pop their ugly heads but not in a sweeping scale, nor scope to poor countries back to yesterday's heavy state-controlled closed-door environment. With each passing day, ease of doing business is improving, more entrepreneurs are born, and more private enterprises are employing more people, creating more value. Now, Zooming in on emerging markets, we see divergent paths. India, ASEAN 5, and China race much faster than Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America. Why so? It's a combination of Asian relative advantages. Focus on children's education, high savings rate, investment in infrastructure, relatively stronger institutions than developing economies elsewhere, stability, scale effect of large domestic markets, more regional integration, and the neighborhood effect. In five years, according to IMF's latest projection in July, Asia's share of world GDP could be more than that of the US and Europe combined. So, whether at a country level or company level, getting Asia right is less than an option, more a strategic necessity. This brings us to the second facet of the new global reality. That is, rebalancing to Asia ushers in a more contested world. There was once a romantic time. As a young senator, Biden met Deng Xiaoping in 1979 to embrace China's opening up. In 2001, he supported China's admission into the WTO. During 2011-12, he met Xi Jinping 11 times to assess China's next powerful leader. Then Vice President Biden was, quote, absolutely confident that the economic stability of the world rests in no small part on cooperation between the United States and China. It is the key to global stability." Unquote. At Xi Trump's first meeting in 2017, President Xi said, quote, we have a thousand reasons to get China-US relations right and not one reason to spoil the relationship. Unquote. Was their logic wrong? No, I don't think so. U.S.-China cooperation is a net plus to the global economy and the key to global stability. A spoiled relationship with the U.S. perhaps hurts China even more than it hurts the U.S. So why is the relation dropping to the lowest point in 40 years and moving on a dangerous deteriorating trajectory. When U.S. and China re-established diplomatic ties in 1979, China's per capita GDP was $184 a year, 
When China joined WTO in 2001, China accounted for just 4% of the global GDP. Forecasting from IMF's trend lines, by 2030, China's nominal GDP could overtake the U.S. In purchasing power parity terms, China already became the largest economy seven years ago. China's ascent and the disruption unleashed to the existing global order was unprecedented in speed and scale. Deng Xiaoping once said, "Hide your strength, bide your time." Today, the dragon's weight and gravity simply could not be hidden. Even at a slow down growth pace, between now and 2030, China could add an addition of 17 trillion dollars to its GDP. That is equivalent to adding nearly four and a half current Germany to the global economy. Through Chinese lenses, it's their civilization's rejuvenation. After all, as recently as 1820, China accounted for nearly one third of the world GDP. It shouldn't surprise us to hear President Xi saying that the new era will see China moving closer to center stage. But despite rising confidence. The Chinese psychology lingers in the painful memory of a century of humiliation under the guns and cannons of imperial powers. Time and again, the history of the rise and fall of nations tells us that without a strong manufacturing, there won't be a strong nation. So wrote the first paragraph of the Made in China blueprint. Issued in 2015, to China, climbing the ladder from low-end to high-end industries is a matter of national security, and a necessity as costs of labor, land, energy, and the environment rise. To the U.S. and its advanced country allies, having lost the low and middle ground of industries to state-supported Chinese competition. Having transferred IP willingly, all with no choice, in the hope of a fat profit from China, China Inc.'s ambition of self-reliance in high tech is too alarming, too threatening. I think the essence of U.S.-China rivalry is at its core the war on future technology. China had issued an ambitious. New generation of AI development plan in mid 2017, which aimed at reaching parity with the United States by 2020 and occupy the commanding height of AI technology by 2030. I was chatting with a Carnegie Mellon trained American AI professor over the weekend. He confirmed what Stanford's 2021 AI Index report also shown. That Chinese scholars' AI publications have increased dramatically, not only in quantity but also in quality. The most heated arms race will be in semiconductors. With heavy external dependency, chips are China's and the United States' Achilles heel. A silver lining from China's vulnerability and United States' dependence. On Taiwan's chip fabrication, may mean that both China and the U.S. want to avoid a hot war across the Taiwan Strait, which I see as the most dangerous flashpoint in U.S.-China relations. Clearly, China's external environment is becoming more hostile. Domestically. China confronts four top priorities and will undergo major structural shifts in the coming years. First, to achieve the centennial goal of becoming rich on per capita income by 2049, China needs to maintain a steady range of four and a half to five percent annual growth. Second. To shift the economic model to rely even more on internal circulation. China has been trying to rebalance 
its development model for over a decade. At 2.5% of GDP, net exports as an engine of growth has long lost its steam. Fixed investment shall remain steady. Investment in high-tech manufacturing, such as in semiconductors, computers, medical equipment, new energy generation, and biomedical industries will pick up the slack from less investment in real estate, roads, and bridges. Boosting domestic consumption requires reform. To that end, Beijing has adopted reform measures such as allowing families to have three kids, loosening urban hukou restrictions for rural immigrants, better health care coverage, increasing minimum salary for gig workers, to name a few. In MCHAM China's 2021 China Business Climate Survey, a majority of American firms expressed optimism about their revenue and profit potentials in China. Third, to shift towards a greener model of development. China consumes nearly half of the world's coal, accounts for nearly 30% of the global carbon emission. China has committed to peaking emission of greenhouse gases before 2030 and reaching carbon neutrality before 2060. I think regardless of whether the U.S. will re-ratify Paris Agreement or not, regardless whether U.S.-China will cooperate on climate change or not, China's green drive, I believe, is unwavering because Chinese themselves need to breathe clean air and see blue skies. According to the 14th Five-Year Plan released this year, non-fossil fuel will account for 20% of primary energy by 2025, 25% by 2030, up from 15% today. President Xi said, a gold mountain is not as good as a green mountain. Environmental protection becomes a core pillar of China's economic transformation. From carbon capture utilization and storage, to clean coal, to pollution control, energy efficiency technology, foreign business could find many opportunities. As typical of Chinese characteristics, China's adoption of EVs is fast. Last year, China accounted for 40% of the global battery plus hybrid light vehicle sales. Two thirds of all public EV charging points installed globally were installed in China. Fourth is to shift towards an innovation driven economy. Confronted by an aging population, shrinking workforce, rising cost of labor, land, and environmental degradation, China has no choice but driving productivity growth. China has learned from the rich countries' journeys that no country can escape middle-income trap without R&D centrality. U.S. and allies' sanctions on technology exports to China, from chips to advanced chip-making equipment, has given Beijing heightened urgency and more determined resolve to go self-reliant on critical technologies. Facing China's challenge, we see more countries letting the visible hands of state play a bigger role. More industrial policies, more state support for ever more sectors identified as of national security concerns. China's ambition to become a technology superpower by 2049 will be a tough uphill climb. State power can move mountains. But when it comes to foundational research, science, and technology, great leap forward often end up in high inputs but low returns. Take the example of C919, the narrow body single aisle jet, which will finally be flown by a Chinese airline this year. Despite over a decade and dozens of billions of state support, 
other than tail and wind, the heart and brain of C919 still rely upon Western technologies. So, political hawks may define win-win as I win twice. Business executives search for win-win that can be mutually beneficial. As a U.S. foreign policy engage and hedge was yesterday's approach for business, it's still a smart strategy. In a multipolar world, business go where markets are, where talents are abundant. Business build bridges. On that note, over to Anil. Hayan spoke about restructuring of the global economy. Restructuring is always an asymmetric process, often leading to friction among nations, such as between US and China. What I will cover are other massively critical developments that are far less asymmetric and that bring nations together. In particular, I'll focus on two. First, the transformation of globalization, that is interconnectedness among nations, from trade in atoms to flows of bits and bytes. Second, the crisis of global warming that is affecting every corner of the earth. I will close by drawing the implications of the developments that Hyun spoke about and that I cover for companies. Big media, including top tier outlets, have been somewhat simplistic in their reporting on globalization. They look at the former US president's rhetoric about America first and the turn towards nationalism during the pandemic and bemoan the supposed end of globalization. To me, this is akin to a hypothetical observer in the late 1990s who looks at declining sales of chemical films and laments the supposed end of photography. In reality, as these graphs show, trade in physical goods has been on a glide path to history for many years and long predates both Trump and the pandemic. The drivers are secular, unlikely to reverse, and in fact, are gathering steam. First, global trade in big commodities, oil, coal, iron ore, has been declining and will continue to do so for the foreseeable future. Second, automation and rising wages in emerging markets will continue to diminish the incentive for wage arbitrage and offshoring of blue collar work. Third, the exponential growth in e-commerce continues to put a premium on faster turnaround from order to delivery and thereby on shorter supply chains. Instead of linkages via atoms, the new story is about linkages via flows of data, both paid and free. Cross-border data flows are growing at an astounding 50% a year. According to McKinsey's analysis, they now have a bigger impact on world GDP than trade in physical goods. So, to paraphrase what they say in monarchies at the passing of kings, the old physical globalization is dead. Long live the new digital globalization. Another metric as captured in this chart supports this observation. Cross-border trade in non-free digital services, movies, music, video games, is growing rapidly. We don't yet have data for 2020, but I would be willing to bet that there has been a huge ramp up in 2020 and 2021. No wonder that rather than consider rejoining the TPP, Biden is pushing for a digital trade pact among all of the Asia-Pacific nations, once again, excluding China. The new era of digital globalization is playing out in a number of ways. First, consumers are spending a greater share of their money on products that are purely digital and are purchased and consumed via streaming, mostly on a cross-border basis. Anytime, Someone in India watches Game of Thrones or something on YouTube when is looking at cross-border flows of data. Second, many products 
that historically were purely physical and now digitally connected. A wind turbine, an oil well, a Tesla car, or an iPhone are not just physical goods that make up global supply chains. Even after the physical product is purchased, installed, and in use, digital services keep riding on top of the sensors and software embedded in these products. Many of these digital services are produced and delivered globally. Third, cross-border collaboration, both among scholars as well as among the R&D units of multinationals, is also growing rapidly. The COVID pandemic has added impetus to collaborative science across borders. Last year saw the emergence of over 100 different vaccine development efforts, most involving cross-border collaboration. Fourth, look at the globalization of ideas. Every scientist working on an AI algorithm is scouting the world for the latest ideas on which to build his or her work. Budding tech entrepreneurs everywhere in the world routinely track the types of ventures that are launched and funded in Silicon Valley. It's often a matter of weeks before the idea gets replicated far from its country of origin. All of these developments are being fed by the emergence of global cloud services that make connectivity faster, more reliable, and cheaper. Yet another input into this process, spurred especially by the pandemic, is easier access to global talent. Once companies and people become adept at work from home, it doesn't take much imagination to see that more of the work can now be done by people sitting practically anywhere in the world. The other mega trend that unites us all, though not in a happy way, is the rapidly worsening crisis of global warming. Data spanning over 100 years is pretty persuasive. The correlation between atmospheric CO2 concentration and average surface temperatures on the Earth is close to one. The just released report from the IPCC is justifiably quite alarming. Numbers aside, we can see the effects of global warming up close in terms of extreme weather patterns in every corner of the globe. Look at the events of the past few weeks. We have had historic flash floods in Germany and China and unprecedented wildfires in Turkey and California. The world's response by governments, corporations, and citizens needs to focus on both sides of the coin, how we produce energy and how we consume it. As this graph shows, on the production side, wind and solar continue their upward march. Yet, our dependence on oil and coal is so large, almost 60% of the total, that will take a few decades for renewables to become the dominant source of the world's energy needs. Regarding coal, the world depends massively on China's willingness and ability to reduce its extreme reliance on this highly polluting material. Rapid fire action is needed also on the consumption front. Europe's newly announced carbon border adjustment mechanism that would levy import duties on carbon inefficient goods is far reaching in terms of ambitions. Let's hope that this plan gets approved by the European governments. If so, it's also likely to put greater pressure on China. The transportation sector is the world's number one consumer of primary energy. It's fantastic to see the world moving aggressively towards more fuel efficient cars, in particular EVs. Isn't it great that the champions of this transformation are no longer just governments, but even more importantly, investors. Look at what Wall Street is demanding from GM and Ford. You have in Europe, you have Volkswagen among others, and in China, a whole slew of companies, including BYD and NIO. 
investor pressure is on across sectors, not just transportation, but also steel, oil, construction, you name it. Let me now turn to what all of these developments mean for companies. From the rise of emerging markets, including Asia and especially China, to growing geopolitical tensions, to a world connected more by data than by atoms, to the agony of global warming, we live in an era of rapid change. Even if the rate of change remains the same, given the power of compounding, the global economy will change more in the next 10 years than it did over the last 25. As Peter Drucker wisely observed, change is also an opportunity for entrepreneurs and those who think like entrepreneurs. This chart captures well acceleration in the pace of change. The process continues unabated. Apple launched the world's first true smartphone in 2006. Today, 4 billion people, almost every adult in the world, is a smartphone user. Technologies have cascading effects. Without smartphones, we simply could not have the ride-hailing industry and companies such as Uber, Didi, Ola, or Grab. A parallel outcome of the rise of smartphones is that the world is now awash with unstructured data in the form of text messages, tweets, images, and videos. Unstructured data now accounts for 80% of all new data creation. This is a phenomenal opportunity for companies that can exploit this type of data using the power of machine learning to codify it. Often, it is young startups who are faster in sensing and exploiting the new opportunities. Just look at the huge increase in global VC funding to tech ventures in every corner of the world. Not just Silicon Valley, but also Beijing, Bangalore, Singapore, Seoul, London, Berlin, Sao Paulo, and also newer hubs such as Nairobi and Lagos. For incumbent companies, the choice is starkly clear. Either you learn to play the new game or you will die. Playing the new game doesn't always mean head-to-head -head competition between startups and the incumbents. Often enough, what makes more sense for both sides is to partner. This is evident from the rapid growth in the number of corporate venture capital deals. The young venture brings new technology, new business models, new strategic insights. As a complement, what the incumbent brings is capital, an existing operational base, and existing customer relationships. Often, it can be a marriage made in heaven. Pulling it together, here are eight rules in the new playbook for winning. First, become a grandmaster at exploiting unstructured data via machine learning and analytics. Second, with a more detailed understanding of each customer enabled by digitization and decoding of unstructured data, pursue hyper-customization, ideally to the level of each customer being a segment of one. Third, as I discussed earlier, double down on investing in, partnering with, and learning from startups who might otherwise succeed in killing your company. Fourth, Given the crisis of global warming and relentless pressure from governments, investors, customers, even your staff, embrace end-to-end -end sustainability in your extended value chain. Paul Polman, the recently retired CEO of Unilever, was quite present in this regard. Fifth, deepen commitment to emerging markets, especially emerging Asia. For some companies, such as Facebook or Twitter, China is obviously out of bounds. However, in many industries, from autos to pharma to banking, China remains an accessible, albeit highly competitive market. Aside from China, you have even faster growing markets in India and ASEAN. Sixth, if you happen to be 
in a global as distinct from multi-domestic industry, you need to globalize rapidly in order to benefit from economies of scale and avoid being run over by your competitors. Often, these tend to be industries that require huge investments in R&D, which does not need to be replicated across markets, but can be exploited globally in one sweep. Seventh, irrespective of whether you operate in a global or multi-domestic industry, master global learning so you can benefit from the rapid diffusion of ideas and technology underway in every industry. Last but not least, in a world likely to keep bringing unexpected shocks, build resilience. This means that extreme cost minimization can no longer be the primary objective. One must also build a certain level of redundancy in the system. And it means that your supply chains must continue to become even more responsive to both expected changes as well as unexpected shocks. Thank you very much. It's been an honor for Haim and me to speak with you. Thank you, Anil and Haiyan. There's so much to unpack from that presentation, the urgency to transform our business models so that we can not only survive, but thrive, the realities of the changing structure and dynamics of the global economy, and the opportunities that will unlock for us once we embrace the changes within our own structure. And now, a few highlights to get you excited about what's coming up next. We're going to be moving into our breakouts now, led by industry experts on a series of fascinating topics. From global food marketing to e-commerce for a sustainable future. From 5G revolution to the culture edit. From saving the planet while feeding the world to tackling fashion trends that will impact our brands for tomorrow. And of course, to harness the power of digital transformation. That's quite a lineup. How often do you get to save the world while rocking the latest fashion trends? That's why I love this industry. Make sure to consult your schedules and join me right back here for our final keynote delivered by someone described as the rock star of disruption. Energizing, stimulating, contemporary, fun, passionate, and funny. The most effective and relevant speaker on the topic of chaos. You could say an intellectual can of Red Bull. Enjoy your breakouts, and I'll see you right back here for a jolt of brain caffeine.